Live from a grungy kitchen table located in Annapolis, Maryland's scenic and historic capital, it's the Maryland Crabs Podcast. With each episode, your hosts, Tim Hamilton, John Frenet, and the occasional guest will dive in and pick apart the stuff that really matters most to you. We're too lazy to actually solve any of these problems, but we can definitely stir the pot. From schools, politics, parking in the fire lane, to those horrible people who drive BMWs. And here with this week's episode, live from the kitchen table, Tim Hamilton and John Frenet. Hey, it's the Maryland Crabs. We're back. How are you? I overslept this morning badly. Yeah, we had a debate last night. Not, not a debate. We had a forum last night. Yeah, yeah. You got to be clear about that because in a debate, we would have been jumping in and fact checking and smacking people down, and we did none of that. We were just kind of hands off. Right. It was sort of a uh, overview of where all four mayoral candidates for the city of Annapolis elections stand, and we do have a primary coming up on September 19th. Uh, the general election, of course, is in November, and we had Senator John Astle. Mr. Gavin Buckley, Gavin. Nevin Young, and um, Mayor Michael Panalides. And it was the first time we had all four candidates on stage, and we did it at the Ram's Head, which was a great venue. Yeah, thanks to the Ram's Head. They really bent over backwards to accommodate us. They were phenomenal. And Adam McIntosh, he was our audio engineer. He was phenomenal. Fantastic. We love that guy. He was. And actually, when I even screwed up and had the wrong cable to do the our Facebook Live on the All Annapolis page, uh, we did it just recording off of the internal microphone from the iPhone. It didn't sound bad. And it, and it didn't sound yeah, We'll bad. fix that next time, we swear. But in case you were bitching about that sound, this episode will be a rebroadcast of that in the audio coming right from the board, so it'll be very clear and crisp. Yeah, it'll be good. It, we had a lot of fun. I, we were, I, I wasn't nervous about it. it was, uh, the, the candidates were great. Uh, everyone came pretty well prepared. It was, it was really good. It was. The audience, uh, the candidates behaved. The audience too. was great. The yeah we had uh, packed house just about or just over three hundred people at Ram's Head uh, eating and drinking yeah. in moderation uh, except for that one woman at that one table that kept one raising table. her hands yes. and uh, screaming and hey, I, she was rowdy yeah and we know who she was that's right we won't say names yet yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so that, that was a great time. Um, w- the way we, we, I think we said that in the intro to it, the way that we had assembled the questions was we put it out to you guys and we did get a lot of feedback. Uh, we got a ton of emails. We had about six or seven questions because John meticulously and in an anal retentive way went through the, the schedule as what, where we wanted to be because we wanted to keep it an hour and a half so we wouldn't bore everybody. By his calculations, we could only do four questions. So there was a couple other questions that I wanted to get into. We wanted to get into finances, but that was one that we couldn't just because they only had three minutes apiece for, and just to dig into the finances was going to be brutal. So what we want to do is after the primary and we have uh, whittled down to our two candidates, we want to have a debate. And in that debate, we're going to have many more questions and they're going to be very, very specific. And we can uh, semi fact check during that um, because we're going to have more information uh, at our fingertips and they're going to know what the questions are going to be just because they'll be able to guess it and we're gonna know what the question is gonna be because we control it so uh i guess we're gonna start planning that eventually and by we i mean john because john planned 95 percent of all that and i just showed up That's in like, a killer suit by the way you know i you know i got okay all right we're gonna bitch about this we had lunch on tuesday yep i was there and made the agreement what was the dress code no i said i said i said, I said okay no ties so i show up in no tie and uh tim just gets off the plane from freaking like milan with a it was a good tie. Yeah. And now we all know your religion. So I I didn't say no tie. You said no tie. And I was not. Uh, you suck. Just let's I was on. not on let's, the let's no move tie on. I'm, not, I'm not getting over it. Okay. We're, we're moving on. Uh, you, know what I am pissed, you know what I am pissed off at? You look at the reaction we had when we did the Facebook Live and everything else. And this is something that goes back way. People don't care about elections. And this is the stuff they need to care about. Uh, when I got home last night, I found out that. The tilted kilt up at the Annapolis Mall. Mm-hmm. Uh, they pulled a market house and they gutted the whole building and moved out in the middle of the night and screwed the Annapolis Mall out of the rent, presumably. And if you don't know, the tilted kilt is essentially a shanty Irish plastic patty Hooters. It is. I kind of said it was like Hooters. It's kind of white trash. In kilts. In a red light district in Amsterdam, because the the waitresses all sort of stood in the window in their little shorts. I guess, but if you if you're into that thing, just go to a strip club. Just, I mean, I don't understand this half stepping, like, but with yeah. Hooters well, and tilted kilt. It's just people weren't. I looked at that and I looked at the interaction on our Facebook page, and it was just incredible. I mean, we were getting, you know, there's like 400 comments about that, oh. which is which is really inconsequential as opposed to real issues. 
in, as opposed to the real. You know issues. what? And Nevin, here's what. Okay, so if you guys, we've, you, if you haven't listened to the interviews we've had with the candidates, we've interviewed all four candidates. Uh, we interviewed Gavin twice because he called us twice, and we had Nevin on. And Nevin was a dark horse. We knew nothing about Nevin. And here's if you listen to the uh, podcast, which is why you're here now. Nevin's kind of interesting because he asks kind of these little digging questions. He makes little stabs that are really interesting. And one that he did that was interesting because you're not going to be able to see it. He said, how many people here are from Ward 1? And half the room raised their hand. And then he said, how many people are here from Ward 5? And it was just a very small smattering. There was a handful. And he said, that's, that's what I thought. And it was that, I think, and then he went on to, to answer the question, that was the most interesting response of the night to me because it was a total different approach than the other candidates. And I'm just bringing that up because uh, he 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 had an interesting perspective on that one, and that was as long been my complaint that uh, Ward One and nothing against Ward One, but and the downtown has gotten a disproportionate amount of money and attention from city government. Right. Uh, but you know they would say, well, that is that is the obvious child of Annapolis, so we have to. And but but Nevin brought that up. But it was interesting when you talk about issues and what's important to people. Most of the room, uh, maybe not most, but easily half the room was probably lived in and mm-hmm. about Ward One. And Nevin right. Nevin brought that up. It was kind of interesting. Right. But. Well, I'll tell you what I think. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to listen to the tape a little bit more yep. uh, over the next week or so. And, you, and then turn around and you and I can do a sort of a rehash of this thing perhaps next week. Uh, and just talk about the election and the, and the positions of the different candidates and do the pontification and everything else. Yeah. And John put together a straw poll that everybody, they voted afterwards. I don't want to give the uh, results right now. Right. Listen, listen to the debate right now. We'll get to the straw poll. And we had actually a really great response to that. We had uh, about 70% of the room. So you do the math. I can't um, do math. I'm a journalism major. Uh, responded to the straw poll and left, a, left it in the box. So we'll talk about that a little bit after you listen to the debate. But right now, here we've got the first mayoral forum with the four candidates from the Rams head on stage. Thank you, guys, again to the Rams head. And this was held on last night, which would have been June 28th. My dad's birthday. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, and welcome to the Rams Head on stage. Oh, look at that, yeah. Thank you. My name is John Frenet. I'm the publisher of Eye on Annapolis and the co-host of the Maryland Crabs podcast. And this is my co-host, Tim Hamilton, for the Maryland Crabs podcast. First of all, thank you all for coming out on this beautiful night. I don't think we could have ordered a nicer night. Um, I'd rather be out in the street eating, to be honest with you, but... uh, But right away, I do want to thank the Rams head for giving us this room tonight. And it goes all the way from Bill to Kyle to Royal to Laura to Chris to everybody that's working here tonight. Uh, They are serving food. They are serving drinks. Please eat, have a couple drinks, and be very, very kind to your servers because they're going to be busting their humps for you all way tonight, all tonight. And by the way, the food, the forum is free. The food is not, Okay. (laughs) We're broke. It's on John. Order what you want. <laughs> you have lobster? Um, we're broke and we're poor. Um, and now what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn it over to Tim. He's going to sort of explain what's going on tonight. And All right. We'll get going. So on November 7th, no matter what we say, no matter what Ian Annapolis says, no matter what the Capitol says or the Post says, doesn't matter. It matters what the candidates say. So we hope to start that discussion tonight. And the goal of tonight is to get me out of the house, frankly. <laughs> drink beer with real people, but it's also that you know more about the candidates leaving than you you do coming in. Your turn. Is it my turn now? (laughs) All right. Banter. A bit of a bit of quick bit of housekeeping here. If you're not familiar with Ion Annapolis or the Maryland Crabs, please check us out on your table. There, everybody should have gotten a little uh, packet of business cards. Has some self-promotional business cards that are in there. It has a cheap ballot, which has the names of all the four candidates that will be speaking tonight. At the end of the night, just circle who you would be inclined to vote for, and we'll have a box outside of the door that you can drop it in on the way out. If you find two ballots in your little packet, it's Maryland. Feel free, take two votes. It's fine. <laughs> um, there's also a blank card if you want to be. Add it into our email list. You can put your email address down there and also drop that in there as well. Um, We'll keep you in the loop. We are going to be doing a debate. This is a forum. We're going to be doing a debate later on after the primaries. And um, that's kind of about it. When we're done here tonight, there's another room back on the ram's head. If you go out the door and wrap around to your left and just keep going back, there's a room called the fountain room. And we've got tables set up for all four candidates. 
as well as for several community groups that had asked to be here tonight. Uh, learn a little bit more about the groups and certainly about the candidates. And most importantly, you can get all that important swag to deck out your yard and your bumper. All right. So like John said, this is not a debate. It's a forum because a debate would have taken too much work and we weren't doing it. So uh, it's, since it's the primary, we're not going to be as in-depth as we will be when we have the debate. And we're going to schedule that. So for right now, we're just going to whittle down the questions. So... This is going to be kind of laid back, and then uh, when the debate comes, that'll be your mudslinging and your, uh, your arrows and your slings and, so, uh, and the swimsuit competition. So uh, what we did is we solicited questions for tonight, and we did that through our Facebook page. We did it through Annapolis, We did it uh, email, Twitter, and we, got, we actually, surprisingly, we got a ton of questions. So I poured over those questions, and by that, I meant I just kind of glanced at them and then sent them on to John. And then uh, John wrote them down, and he boiled it down. So we have a few questions that we're going to ask each candidate, and they're going to each answer in turn, and we're going to do that. Rota we're going to rotate it round robins to, to keep it fair. Uh, and so you can compare apples to apples. And they'll have three minutes to respond before we move on. Now, if we keep, this, uh, if we keep them on time, and the, my lovely wife is going to be keeping time tonight, as she does with me, uh, we'll be done in about 90 minutes. So if we're not done in 90 minutes, oh, yeah. Uh -huh. That's it. Don't. We're going to take this powerful horn. There it is at its full blast. I, you know what? I, did, I wasted a week yeah, okay. my kids well, this morning. We're going to rope them off the stage. So Three minutes. So we should be done in about 90 minutes. If we're not done in 90 minutes, uh, if the wait staff would just monitor my beer and just... Uh, so uh, with that said, let's get underway and bring our candidates for mayor of the city of Annapolis in alphabetical order. We're going to start with uh, State Senator John Astle. There he is. We, we got some on the table for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have Mr. Gavin Buckley. <laughs> Current mayor of Annapolis, Mayor Michael Panelides. Good job stacking the room, Mike. <laughs> and Mr. Nevin Young. Thank you to all gentlemen for coming out. So to start, uh, for those who may not know the candidates, each one will have three minutes to introduce themselves and let us know what they need to know about why they're running for office. And we'll start with the way they were introduced with Senator Astle and then rotate through the rest. So Senator Astle, if you have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, and you guys can feel free to stand up. There's a little bit of room on the microphones if it feels really, more comfortable to do that. To. Yeah, Don't let him boss you. I, I learned a long time ago to stand up. Um, get out from behind the, uh, the barrier between you and the audience. I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. I really appreciate your interest in what we're doing. You know, this is the democratic process, and it requires participation on the part of the public. And so your attendance here indicates a strong desire to engage in that participation. Um, I'm, I could give you my biographical sketch, but if you really want to know about it, go to the web page and you can get all that. And so I'm not going to tell you from birth that how I got here. Um, <laughs> What I do want to tell you is uh, I think my life has been one of service since I got out of school. Um, I served the nation as an officer in the Marines. I served the Baltimore City Police uh, community as a police officer in the city of Baltimore. And I've served the community of Annapolis uh, both as a member of the House of Delegates and a member of the Senate. And over that time, I've learned a lot about how government works and how government doesn't work. I've gained experience on how you make things happen when you're in government. And I'd like to take that experience and translate it into some of the things that I think Annapolis needs. I have a vision for how I'd like the city to go, and to do that um, is going to take some of this experience. Uh, one of the things that I've, I've learned, um, a couple of times I tried to use my position as a member of the Senate to do some things to help the city, but I didn't get quite uh, the cooperation that I really thought that I needed. And eventually I decided if I really wanted to make those changes, I needed to drive the bus. So I'm actually auditioning for bus driver of the city of Annapolis as we move forward into the next, uh, the next decade. So with that, um, I know there's some questions, and that's really what you came here for, and I'm going to look forward to answering those questions. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And I'd like to 
point out also for the candidates that we have our time right here. I knew that uh, Senator Astle goes a long way, so he's got that internal clock, so he didn't need it. But we have the we have the, the, the timekeeper right there, and she'll give you the stink eye when you start approaching. So, okay. Mr. Buckley. Hey, I want to thank everybody that came out tonight. Um, I, my mum would be really proud of this. <laughs> I feel like I'm successful already because there's 350 people in this room. So, um, thank you. So, uh, I'm not a politician. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a guy with a bunch of businesses on West Street. Um, I've uh, been very lucky uh, in this town. This town has been really good to me. I, I sailed in here 25 years ago with a couple of hundred bucks in my pocket. I got a job as a waiter at Middleton's Tavern. I saw a vacant shop that had been vacant for, for a year and I turned it into a coffee shop. It was my first ever business. I did a business that hadn't been in this town before. So we didn't have a coffee shop. We didn't have a Starbucks back then and, and I brought a coffee shop to town called The Moon. Um, uh, a, a little bit later on, um, I looked out on West Street and um, uh, I started a business on West Street. There was a vacant shop there that had been vacant for over a year. And we took that vacant shop and we brought something different to town. We brought a kind of late night rock and roll sushi joint. Um, a couple of years later, there were some buildings that were going to get torn down on West Street. And we, um, uh, we, they were going to tear them down and build an 800 car garage. The buildings were less than 100 years old, but we thought it was important to save those buildings. They were, um, because that's what makes this town great. It's scale and it's fabric. So we, we convinced the city to scale that garage back and make it a 300 car garage. And that's where we did Lemongrass, Metropolitan, Hudson Fouquet. We did a gift shop called Object, an art shop, um, and a fashion store. And fashion was a challenge in Annapolis back then, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> um, during that time, we drove um, an arts agenda for the street. We drove cultural growth for the street. So we brought things uh, like the first Sunday Arts Festival, Dining Under the Stars, a Fringe Festival, the banners you see up on lampposts, the chickens, the murals that you see on the street. So that cultural growth and those restaurants that we did on West Street, we did for you guys. Um, and I've been successful because of you guys. You guys have supported us from day one. And so, uh, so we made West Street a, a street for locals. We drove it for you guys. And I feel like our downtown needs um, to be made for locals. So if we had um, created a downtown for locals, we'd have better shopping, we'd have better restaurants. Today there are currently more vacancies on Main Street than there are on West Street. And years ago, West Street, no, nobody gave West Street any chance. So I want to um, uh, do th the things that we've done on West Street in downtown. I want to connect our communities. Um, I want to mobilize our communities through bike paths and running paths and things that make your town livable. Uh, and with your help, um, I will get to the next level. And there's lots more questions that I'm going to answer tonight. But I just want to thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Buckley. <laughs> next up. Mayor Panellini's, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. I want to first start off by thanking John and Tim and Ramshead for hosting this event for us. I'm your mayor, Mike Panellini's, and I just want to, I want to say it's been an honor and my dream to serve as your mayor these last four years. One of the things I wanted to do tonight was tell you a little bit about my background. I want to tell you about where I came from, what I've done as mayor, and more importantly, my vision and where we're going to go in the future. You know, I grew up here. I played sports here. I went to school here. I became an Eagle Scout here. This is my home. And it hurt me to see the city going in the wrong direction. So I decided to take a leadership role and run for mayor of Annapolis. And I'd like to talk to you about why I ran and what happened. You know, before I ran for office, the city was in deep financial trouble. We had two rounds of massive tax increases. Our trash got cut back to once a week. And the city had to borrow $10 million just to meet payroll. I'm proud to say that since I've took office, we've passed four budgets in a bipartisan fashion without raising the tax rate. We've lowered the trash bills by 40%, and we don't have to borrow money just to meet payroll anymore. You know, we were focused on infrastructure. We had a city dock that was literally crumbling into the ground. What did we do? We rebuilt it. And not only did we build it on schedule, we built it a million dollars under budget. We had, I might ask to hold the applause because I'm going to go over my time limit. Um, but thank you all, we can do it at the end. Now, we had a market house, been closed for nine years, cost the city $6 million. And I'm proud to say it's been open every single day under my administration and making money. You know, I realized something early on about being mayor of Annapolis. You know, there's 157 cities in the state of Maryland. Only four of them have partisan elections. 
meaning you run as a Democrat or Republican. And I realize if I'm going to lead, I have to do it in a bipartisan fashion. And that's what I've done. There's no Democrat or Republican way to put out a fire. I've reached across the aisle. We've got things done, and it's been good results. So I'm excited tonight to share my vision with you and where I'm going to take the city in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And finally in the rotation, we have Mr. Nevin Young. Mr. Young? Uh, good evening. My name is Nevin Young. Uh, I'm a lawyer. I practice law here in Annapolis. Uh, I first came here in 1992 to go to St. John's College. Um, I'm a graduate of the George Washington University Law School. Um, let me ask something. How many people from Ward 1 here tonight? Show of hands. Okay. How many people from Ward 5? Okay. Um, that's, that's one of the points that I wanted to make. Um, I don't think you even had to look around the room. Um, uh, you know, when, I, when this mayor, and actually, honestly, every four years, it seems, uh, people go to look for a leader for the city, and they address the same old themes, and they seem to approach the same old problems. And um, one thing that always resonates with people, I hear it in my office, in my law practice all the time, you know, when I decided to run, um, I had just been watching this uh, atrocious argument over the golf course um, between the city council, um, the sale of the golf course. I had just heard about the planned development of 147 uh, units of apartment, uh, apartments in uh, the Eastport Shopping Center, and I had just had a young man in my office who'd been shot on Madison Street, um, fortunately not killed, but had been shot. and. Um, realize you know, there's really something we need to do about our priorities in the city of Annapolis in addressing problems that face us all. Um, you know, I, I've told people this at the Ward 1 Residence Forum. I'm not running for mayor of Ward 1. Uh, I'm running for mayor of the entire city of Annapolis. And that means addressing, uh, addressing certain issues um, that a lot of us have been comfortable um, not really pushing toward and not really um, challenging or questioning why we're doing things. At the same time, we can move the city and the Ward 1 business district into a modern age with better technology. Uh, we can have mobile technology to tell people where to park, for instance. We can have signs that tell people where to park. We can shunt traffic where it needs to go. Um, it seems for years and years and years now, people have complained about the number one parking uh, problem downtown being parking, and we have not really used technology to address it. We also haven't used technology to address the way the citizens communicate with the city. That is, uh, there's no reason we can't have a website just like the White House has a petition site where people can ask questions of the leadership. Um, I'm going to wrap up now because they keep flipping, you know, <laughs> it's like that old soap opera, like sands through the hourglass. <laughs> so, or, yeah. anyway. Um, but, so I'm running for mayor to try to, to um, push toward addressing some real problems that have been recurring for many of us every election cycle. And every election cycle, we think that some progress will be made. And every time it seems to get bogged down in some kind of process where things don't move forward. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Young. All right, now we start with the questions. So these are the questions that we gleaned from the people who, who contacted us, again, through our website and through our Facebook and Twitter. And uh, John parsed all these, and this is what we come up with. So gentlemen, we're going to start the rotation as we began, and then each we'll uh, alternate with each question that we have. Senator Rassel, will start with the first question, and then Mr. Buckley will start with the second, and Mayor Panelides, and But everybody gets the same question. Mr. Young. So we're doing this alphabetically, okay. Right. I'm all right. We're going to start this way. Okay. Ready? All right, so, <laughs> Senator Astell, if you were a tree, what kind of, oh wait, no. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, that was the draft, okay. That's a spelling error. Yeah, sorry, sir. The first question is on development. There have been several high profile projects proposed or currently under construction in Annapolis, including the village at Providence Point, formerly known as Crystal Spring, Eastport Landing, the former Fawcett's property on Compromise Street, and the former Recreation Center on St. Mary Street. Proponents and supporters of these projects contend that they are fulfilling a need within the city, expanding the tax base, and providing badly needed jobs. Opponents argue that these developments are unneeded and negatively impact traffic, schools, the environment, infrastructure, and our general quality of life. 
As mayor, how would you mitigate the delicate balance between the rights of property owners and the concerns of the citizens? Is that a filibuster or a question? I'm just, uh, <laughs> um, you know, one of the things I've learned um, in the years that I've been in, in uh, public office is that everybody has an opinion. And so in order to deal with that, you've you got to have things pretty clear. So the first thing that I would do is uh, within the first six months come out with what I call the plan for the vision for 2030 as to how this city is going to be and what we want to see this city. And then parts of that are going to involve zoning and permitting and the, the city code. Now, those projects that you're hearing about, um, I've talked to developers, I've talked to attorneys, I've talked to a lot of people, and I think part of the problem that they've encountered is there's some confusion about what city law really was. And, and for example, the one in Eastport, there's some confusion about the number of, of condos that could be built into that place because the code is, it needs to be cleaned up and addressed. Um, the zoning, there's some issues with that. The permitting, uh, I was talking to a, a business the other day Three years it took to get permits uh, finally issued. And those are the kind of things, I think, that drive business away and really stifle the development. I think in some instances, Annapolis has gotten a reputation of being a place you don't want to take your business because of the difficulty in getting through the process in city government. So if I were mayor, I would begin by cleaning up the process. People have to understand that the zoning code is the zoning code and it needs to be clear and understandable. The permitting process needs to be done in a way that it happens very quickly. I would, uh, I think, advocate for an ombudsman, if you will, or a, a guide of some kind that could help this business get through that process. So, you know, the, the permitting process, there's a lot of little twists and turns and things that the businesses have to do to meet the law. Now, I'm not suggesting that we um, bypass the law, but help people do what they have to do to meet the requirements of the law. And then thirdly, um, make sure that the city helps these businesses as most they can uh, and i would also advocate businesses working together I, I think in some instances businesses are not working they're competing with each other but if you look at it across the city the core issues for those businesses are exactly the same they might live in different neighborhoods they might have uh, idiosyncrasies in those neighborhoods because of the culture of those neighborhoods but ultimately the core desire of the businesses is to do business in a friendly atmosphere. So with that, uh, I got 15 seconds. Thank you. So Mr. Buckley, how would you mitigate the delicate balance between the rights of property owners and the concerns of the citizens? Um, I, I think it's, a, it's down to transparency. So um, if you look at our record on West Street, when uh, development comes to West Street, we, uh, we manage to get it unopposed. So we take, um, we get people around a table before problems happen. We sit down with developers and we sit down with residents and we come up with a plan, a compromise. And any people that can't compromise, you know, you're not credible because in this world we all have to compromise somewhere or other. So West Street's a great example of how to get things done. I don't think if uh, anyone thinks the system is working, if you're a, a resident and you're trying to get a permit or whether you're a developer, you're trying to get a permit, you still have the same complaints. So what's wrong with the picture there? We need to make people that work in the permits office realize you know, that we're all in this together. You know, we should have an office of what can I do to help you, not what I can do to hurt you. Everybody's experienced it pretty much in this, in, in this room. So, <laughs> so um, I talk about um, uh, a one-stop shop for permits. Um, what if we take one of our vacant shops on Main Street and we make that a permit office? What if we put the conference table in the window uh, and what do we put a 100-day counter above the applicants? And if you were walking down that street, at the very least, you'd see people with their heads in their hands going, what's happening to me? You know? <laughs> so, so you could feel their pain. But we have to get, some, we have to get uh, creative on this stuff because it's not a new thing. It's not Mike's fault. It's, you know, it's been going on for a long, long time. We need to um, change the culture. And you have to change the culture by making people realize you know, you're in the service business. We're all in the service business. So let's all work together to make this a better process. Um, on development, you know, we have to look at the areas that are getting hammered the hardest. You know, um, I think uh, I look at East Port, La East Port Landing and I say, look, you guys have got to meet in the middle. You know, I know that 127 is the, is the number that um, has to happen for it to be possible. But 
I think you've got to come down. And the people that... And they got bad information, those developers, so they deserve some rights as well. We should say, you know, get the people that think 60 is the number and come up to, to somewhere in the middle. When I look at Crystal Springs, I think we could have done so much better. You know, we could have come up with a plan uh, that, the, that everybody would support, you know. The worst thing is to find out about what's happening in your neighbourhood in the front page of the Capitol. When you're a mayor, you can be intimately... <laughs> You should be intimately involved with every planned development in the city. And you should sit down. That You should be the first point of contact when you come to the city. And you should give developers the realities. So um, I will be that kind of guy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Buckley. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, how would you mitigate the delicate balance between the rights of property owners and the concerns of the citizens? Well, let me start off by saying... I think development was the major issue in the last election, and it's the thing that won me the election. And I want to say, starting off, that we can't just roll over and let people build whatever they want, whenever they want. So I'll tell you a story real quick. Before I was mayor, there was no adequate public facilities for schools in the city of Annapolis. In Anne Arundel County, if schools were overcrowded, you could stop one, someone from developing. That's not the case in the city. It was like the Wild West. You could build whatever you want, whenever you wanted. And that ended during my administration. I also want to talk about traffic. It's a major issue. Look, I live off Forest Drive in Hunt Meadow. I experience it every single day, and I understand people's frustrations. So I want to tell you about what we're doing to fix it. First, working with Anne Arundel County, we have a great partnership. We're doing a Forest Drive sector study. So we're studying how that road's going to be, not just 5, 10 years, 15 years from now. Number two, we're also installing, actually Anne Arundel County already has traffic cameras all along Forest Drive. Everyone complains about traffic studies. They're not done right. It was on a rainy day. They don't work. Now we have real-time big data that can tell you how many cars went by every single day so we can start figuring out what we're going to do about this. The third thing is when developers come in to build a project, if it generated 400 car trips, it required a study. We've now lowered that to 250 to stand on the side. Uh, my administration's changed land use policies. You know, they mentioned earlier, before it was, let's just annex everything in. Think about the things I've had to address. Crystal Spring, the Preserve at Parkside, Rocky Gorge. Let's just bring all these things into the city and build these massive developments. That doesn't work, and that's not the case. People's quality of life is what matters in this city, and we've changed that policy. I want to tell you about what we did with the Parkside Preserve. For the first time in the city's history, we used project open space money, and there was land slated for development. We took it off the rolls from development, and we're making a park out of it for the citizens of Annapolis. I want to close talking about Crystal Spring. You know, as many people know, before I was elected, this was a major issue. You know, now, fortunately, the partnership's been dissolved. Everything, you know, they wanted to put commercial the size of the town center over a, um, 100 houses to go up there. That's gone. They went back to Connecticut. But it's important to remember, if I wasn't elected, that project was being fast-tracked and it would have been built. They'd be out there with chainsaws right now, chopping down trees. Election matters, and developers know that. You know, you make friends in this business, but you also make enemies. And when you stop a $300 million project, people are coming after you. You know, I've heard rumors that they're going to spend over $3 million to beat me. And some people say, you're just saying that for fear it's not going to happen. Turn on the radio. The people from the Eastport Shopping Center are running radio ads on me right now as we speak. So all I can tell you is this. I don't know what's coming next on Catherine's property where Crystal Spring used to be, but I can tell you as long as I'm mayor, I will never let them build something like they were trying to do. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Young, same question. How would you mitigate the delicate balance between the rights of property owners and the concerns of the citizens? One, one concern I have here is with the communication between, I mean, I, I understand the mayor's position at this point in time is uh, against the size of the Eastport um, shopping center development, but we know that that project was first sort of proposed and vetted in 2014, and it's been kicked around planning and zoning for the last two, two and a half years, and it really wasn't until the plan was formally submitted um, with planning and zoning saying they thought it was the proper size uh, and people in Eastport uh, took up torches and pitchforks that we heard anything from the administration really saying it was too big. Um, I, I really don't, you know, I don't know how, how did they get to this point of 
citizens groups having to say, we've read the, the law and we think the density calculations are wrong. Um, how did they end up spending, they say, a million dollars on architecture and, and preliminary groundwork for this, and now they're saying that because somebody in the government told them the wrong thing, they should benefit from it and they should be able to build what they want to build. Um, I tell every client I've ever had, if somebody in the government tells you something and they are wrong, you're out of luck. <laughs> That's not like your lawyer where you could sue him for malpractice or your, your doctor or uh, as any other expert, your architect, okay? So that puzzles me. Um, it is a puzzle for me that either the administration broadly didn't know what was going on in planning and zoning or was, was ambivalent about the project up until February or March of this year. Um, the Crystal Spring issue is interesting. They have scaled this project back, but uh, as most of you know, it's not gone away. Um, as a lawyer, I have to tell you something unpleasant, though, that nobody really wants to hear. Um, if people don't let them build anything there, they're going to end up in court, and they're going to ask the judge to say that this is a taking. And they're going to say, tell us what's a reasonable use, or compensate us for the value of this property. That's what they're going to do. And we have a proposed old folks home. I'll call it that. I, I hope I don't offend any old folks. As I get closer to it, I try to have more of a sense of humor about it. But we have probably the least offensive use of that property that could be proposed in the present plan that's been proposed. That doesn't mean it will ultimately be a good idea or that it should ultimately be approved. But when people look at the new proposal in terms of traffic and in terms of creating jobs, especially jobs that are needed in the wards surrounding that area, um, they really should try to keep an open mind. And you know, if people think that that's a reason not to vote for me, then so be it. But they really need to, to look at the, pra the practical aspects of the revised Crystal Spring uh, development plan and uh, think what will happen if we just keep saying no. Anyway. Thank you, guys. Well, for our second question, we're going to start with Mr. Buckley. And it's about another hot topic for the city. It's about city crime. Following the national trend, Annapolis has experienced, and some people may be shocked at this, a general decrease in violent crime over the past few years. Actually, I think it's been about 10 years. Um, however, the issue of crime is still consistently at the top of the list of everybody in Annapolis. Residents who live in all wards, within all socioeconomic groups, What's more, the national opiate crisis has hit Anne Arundel County hard, and Annapolis particularly hard. And I believe that Anne Arundel County is second to Baltimore City in the number of overdose deaths in uh, Maryland. So there's a really sober, it might be number three, but it's a sobering statistic for you there. But it's getting bad and it's worsening. How would you as mayor address the concerns of the residents who don't feel safe in the city, and particularly those who reside in public housing? So um, this is a, a thing that's uh, pretty personal um, for me. I have young kids, so uh, we're all terrified of those sorts of things happening to our children. But I think we have to look at the communities um, and, and what's happening in these communities. These things don't happen in a, in a vacuum. You know, we, um, the areas where people are going in and purchasing drugs are areas that we haven't invested in. Uh, we haven't helped the police to go into those neighborhoods. We need, we need to invest in the areas of public housing that um, that have been forgotten, and so and we have to ask ourselves a question. You know, if you're a kid and it's a better option for you to um, deal drugs that um, because you don't have any other options, what are we doing wrong as a society? So our, our, those kids. Those kids who think they don't have any hope, who think they don't have an opportunity, who, or who think they don't have, have a chance of a job, we need to find those kids. We need to head the kids off while they're still kids. When I see things um, that we do, when we defund the, the, the rec centres, when we try to sell the, the, the Pip Moyer rec centre, when, um, we, when we take things away that can keep our kids occupied and keep them young for as long as possible because that's the, that's the challenge we don't want our kids to grow up too fast I want them to stay kids I don't want my kids to ever leave home so and I see things happen my kids 
go to public school, you know, and I see my 12 year old now, some of his friends are going in a different direction. I look at some of their Snapchats and their, their things like that. And there, there, are, there are things that are worrying. And so you, my, my goal is to, to make sure that we invest in that, we support the police. I'm doing a, a color run, um, and this is about, I'm about bringing communities together, right? I'm doing a color run um, pretty soon um, that runs uh, through Murray Hill, if any of you don't know what a colour run is, it's a five kilometre race and every kilometre someone throws different colour off you. So we're going to do a colour run through Murray Hill, through Homewood, um, down the Poplar Trail. It's going to go past the police station. I'm going to make the police station a, a blue colour station. We're going to go down uh, Taylor Ave and then we're going to turn right onto Clay Street. And the finish line is going to be at the end of Clay Street at the first Sunday Arts Festival. And that, ra that race is about bringing people together. That, that race is about kids from the Boys and Girls Club who are one of the recipients of the race um, funds, uh, meeting policemen outside of, um, outside of their uniforms, meeting them, seeing a, a, a cop and just knowing that that cop is your neighbor. We need to humanize our police. You know, we need kids to see co cops in a different environment. We need to see them as sports coaches. We need to give our policemen time to do things like that. An hour or two a week would be a great investment. So I am zero, so I've got to get off there. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. Mayor Panelides, uh, as mayor, how have you, I guess, and how would you address the concerns of the residents who don't feel safe in the city, and particularly those in public housing? Sure. Let me start off by saying that public safety is the most important issue that city government does. And I'm proud of my administration. We've had historic and unprecedented investments in our public safety personnel. In this last budget that was passed two weeks ago, we put money in the budget for 10 new police officers, and we put money in the budget for 12 new firefighters through a grant we got from the federal government. When you talk about what happens in the city, it's crime. It all comes from drugs, particularly heroin. And how do we address that? You know, I'll tell you a story. I've been fortunate in my role as mayor. I serve on the county executive Steve Shoes Heroin Task Force. I'm also on the governor's opioid intervention team. And you learn things that are so fascinating about it. You know, one of the things that struck home for me is they said, we gotta get these kids in middle schools when the school comes in there. I said, kids are doing a heroin in middle school? They said, by the time they're in high school, they're already gone. And it just took me back for a second. They're already gone by the time they're in high school. So what do we do to tackle this? One is people need to know where to get help. Mental health is an issue nobody wants to talk about, but we have to. We have safe stations at our police and fire stations. If you have an addiction, you can come by and get help, and people have taken us up on it. How do people get addicted to drugs? Mostly prescription pain kills. I'm proud to say at the Annapolis Police Department, we have a prescription drop-off box. Public service announcement, if you have any uh, unused medicine, please drop it off at our police stations. Um, we saw an increase in crime, and we saw we had to change the way we do things. You know, we have new community policing initiatives, or 16 of them being rolled out. Uh, part of that is the cops getting to know people, walking around. They've got to be out of their cars for 45 minutes every day, interacting with people. Letting the community see them in a different light is so important. We also had to make a change in leadership. You know, one of the things as mayors, you have to hold people accountable. I've said in every issue people bring up, the hardest thing you ever have to do as mayor is to let somebody go. But we are experiencing murders in this city. We made a change. And I'm proud to say that in the last five months after we hired Chief Baker, we haven't had a single murder in the city of Annapolis. <laughs> we needed funding to pay for this. So how do we do it? I took a leadership role, requested that the city council transfer $1.25 million to pay for this. I reached out to Governor Hogan, and he doubled our Safe Streets funding for the city of Annapolis. <laughs> we, brought in, we brought in the state police to come in to help us with it, too. So what are we doing for the housing authority? We're going to get into this in another section. But I want to say my administration was the first to work with the housing authority. It was always, well, that's the federal government's prop, uh, property. Just blame them. I said, listen, everybody in public housing are citizens just like us. And currently, 80%, 80% of all of our deployments are in the public housing communities. So I think you've seen it with the work that I've done in the past. Public safety is important to me in these last four years, and it will be in the future as well. Thank you. Same question for you, Mr. Young. How are you going to address as mayor the residents who don't feel safe in the city, particularly those who reside in public housing? One of the first things uh, 
that I think of when I think about this problem is um, I've always believed in market forces. How long are people going to go out there on that corner and sell drugs? They're going to go out there and sell drugs as long as there's a market for it. As long as they don't have any better options and people are going to pay them, they're going to be out there selling drugs. Um, and one of the things that we haven't done and which would require some state and, and perhaps even federal cooperation is to seriously push for um, actual alternatives uh, similar to the methadone clinics that we have in some areas so that we won't have people getting opioids with fentanyl where with one dose they're dead and there's nothing anyone can do about it. Um, this last year uh, nationwide, uh, opioid overdose surpassed all firearms deaths as uh, a cause of death among Americans. Um, and that means all firearms, whether suicide or, homic or intentional homicide or accident, you know, all of them together. There are more people dying now of overdoses. Um, <laughs> we had had a uh, police chief who went before the General Assembly and testified that on the day Colorado passed its marijuana reform laws that dozens of people had died of uh, marijuana overdoses. It turned out that he referenced an article from The Onion um, for his, for his uh, information. Um, we had a police chief who, when an officer altered a search warrant, um, or I'm sorry, an arrest warrant, in order to justify arresting the wrong person, uh, who not only didn't discipline that officer, but promoted him. Uh, we had a chief police, a police of ch uh, chief of police who was generally and genuinely unresponsive and uncreative and unimaginative for many years, and who has created a culture of division. You go out there and talk to people in the public housing projects, and they'll tell you they're in favor of the new community policing initiatives, and finally, that maybe something will start happening with that. Um, but we have here valuable resources in some of the officers in the Annapolis Police Department who are embroiled in a discrimination lawsuit instead of being tasked to help uh, form better relations with the public housing uh, communities. And <clears throat> we finally started taking action here. Um, because for a long time, we had the same old attitude, lock them up. We've been locking them up for longer than I've been alive, probably lo longer than anybody in this room's been alive, and we haven't seen a whole lot of results from it. So we need, we need to be more creative in caring about people uh, as, as medical problems rather than as criminal problems, and in not making people afraid of the police uh, when they address these issues. Thank you. And we'll throw it down here to Senator Astle. How would you reassure the residents of the city who don't feel safe, and particularly those who reside in public housing? That sounds like the same question. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, you can one go of with the, the tree, things, if you want. I'm sorry. You can go with the tree if you want. <laughs> okay. One of the things that we sometimes in, in this city don't want to talk about is we have two communities. We have one with wealth and influence, or affluence and influence, and one without. And the one without is where we see a lot of the problems. And I think to begin with, we need to provide um, after-school uh, activities for these kids. I know we had something at the Pitt Moyer Center, and that's been kind of uh, on, um, on shaky ground. It's gone, huh? It's, it's back again? I don't think it ever left. But... Okay, good. Well, it's good, because that's something that's really important. You don't want those kids with, without an after-school activity, because as our mothers used to tell us, idle hands are the devil's workshop. Uh, secondly, we need to ensure that the public schools are providing adequate education. We need to try to ensure that there are jobs, but more importantly to the jobs, we need to ensure we have adequate public transportation because many of these people don't own automobiles and the only way they're going to get to work is if we have adequate, uh, reliable public transportation here in the city. Um, with regard to the police, you know, you heard the mayor say they get out of their cars for 45 minutes. Well, that's 45 minutes in an entire shift. And I'm not sure that 45 minutes in an entire shift is enough time for those, those officers out on the street to be able <laughs> to be able to, to get to know the people because that, that trust between the officers and the community is, is vitally important. If people don't trust that the officers are there to protect and serve them, they're not likely to talk about some of the activities that they're seeing in the city. 
if they see those activities and they report those activities, then the police have a better ability to try to solve the crimes, or in some cases, even prevent them from happening. And thirdly, with the, regard to the, uh, the drugs, you know, as you heard, it's a pretty serious problem, and more people are dying now than from guns. It's a, it's a disease. It's a disease. And one of the things that um, w we have a problem now is if uh, somebody finds a patient or a, a person who's uh, out because of an overdose, so where do you take them? Well, the hospital emergency rooms are, are piled high. They don't have room. I would like to see a website so that you could go to that website and find a bed wherever in all the places in Annapolis that treat, or in Anne Arundel County, that treat uh, drug patients. And so you could contact that website. It could tell you where beds are available. to give you the contact information. You can help those people get into effective treatment and try to break that cycle. Thanks. Thank you. I, I just want to say before we get going, we had a little schedule here. And considering that we've got over 40 years of politicians here at number one and number three, we're doing pretty good. We're ahead of schedule by a few minutes. I didn't know we had a schedule. <laughs> he sent me a bunch of emails. I didn't even open them. I'm not going to lie. Did Gavin? The third question. Oh, okay. That's, all right. That was a test. All right. This is another, uh, another filibuster, Senator. It's about uh, the business climate in Annapolis. Owning a business in Annapolis can be a complex affair, especially for those located downtown. Business owners have long complained about what they regard as overly complex procedures and an inordinate amount of red tape in order to open or maintain a business within the city. In the past decade, the city has instituted several programs with the goal of stimulating economic growth. The Office of Economic Development, the Office of uh, Annapolis Economic Development Corporation, and most recently, the current Downtown Annapolis Partnership, which has lost two executive directors within a year. What do you think the role of the city should be in regards to cultivating an environment conducive to business development? And as mayor, how would you address the bureaucratic challenges that impede business owners? We'll start with mayor. So first of all, let me just start off by saying that I understand the business community here in Annapolis. My grandfather had a restaurant, the rural restaurant, literally right next door. My uncles had a jewelry store on Main Street. I get out and I talk with business owners all the time, and they tell me what's going on. They want to cut red tape make things more predictable, and that's what we've done. One of the first things I did as mayor is I merged two departments, planning and zoning and inspection and permits. It was a bureaucracy that didn't need to exist, and we've helped that. But also, we've had a number of successes I want to talk about. It's one thing to say, you know, I've made the city better, but let's talk about things that have actually happened, things that are tangible that people can see. Number one, the old faucets building. I said earlier on that elections matter. That was one of the issues that got me elected. I opposed that Ordan plan that would have destroyed the historic character of downtown Annapolis. So were we going to let the property sit vacant for another nine years? Absolutely not. We worked with the community, talked to people, had extra public hearings. And now I'm proud to say that that building is under construction and is going to be a great addition for the city of Annapolis. Thank you. We've also had 403 new or expanding businesses within the city of Annapolis. You know, you look at some things that were down there. The old Stevens building, things that vacant for years. People wanted to put a Royal Farms. That didn't happen. It's now a Mission Barbecue and one of the most popular restaurants in the city of Annapolis. We talk about the Market House. Closed for nine years, cost the city $6 million. I'm proud to say it's been open every single day. And if you haven't been down there, shame on you. You should go because it's fantastic. They brought back fried chicken, oysters. It's a world-class facility. I also want to talk about how we bring jobs to people. You know, one of the things I learned is we have to connect people in all sorts of jobs. So one of it's our maritime industry. We have over 3,000 people employed in our maritime in the city of Annapolis. We hosted the first maritime summit in the city of Annapolis. Over 100 employers came together to work on issues about how we can grow that. I serve on the Governor, Governor Cybersecurity Task Force, and so we need to do things about promoting IT jobs. There are thousands that are unfilled. But one of the things I'm most proud of is the second chance program we're working on. You know, a lot of people have a past with a criminal background that can't find work. So we're working on hosting the first second chance job fair in the city's history. Another thing we've done, we've done jobs fairs for Maryland Live and other people. Um, we made things easier to get around downtown, and I hope we have a chance to talk about traffic. But just real quick since we've been in here, you can now find the circulator on a mobile app so you know when it comes. You can pay for parking on your cell phone. If you're a resident, instead of going down to City Hall, 
you can simply go forward and fill out the form online. So we've been using technology to make things more efficient and effective. There's a long way to go. Annapolis does have a reputation. We're not there yet, but I'm confident over the next four years we can get there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Mr. Young, what do you think the role of the mayor should be in regards to cultivating an environment conducive to business development? Okay. Um, I think I'm the first candidate in this campaign uh, to mention that we have um, been way behind in implementing uh, digital technology, uh, mobile apps that can direct people. You know, right now, and I said this at the uh, Asbury Church when we first met uh, with Gavin and uh, John, uh, <clears throat> right now people come downtown and what do they do? You all could tell me. They come down and they say, I wonder if there's parking on Main Street. I wonder if the Hillman Garage has parking. And they go down Duke of Gloucester. And then they say, oh, Hillman Garage is closed. And they turn around and they go up Green, down Green Street and up Main Street. And so everybody's sitting in a line and they're milling about and everybody's creating traffic and creating parking problems when if they were coming into town, if they had a mobile app to tell them or if they had signage or both to tell them that you can go this way and there's parking at Gotts. You can go this way and there's so many spaces left on Calvert Street and they would know where to go. People will do what's easy if you let them, if you give them the information. Uh, the other thing though, primarily, and what you can do to help business in, in downtown in terms of the government is it requires a change in attitude. Now, in fairness, this lady no longer works for the city, but the first time I ever dealt with a city employee as a lawyer, I had a guy with a problem with a city office, and I said, oh, well, I'll take up, I was working on Duke of Gloucester, I said, I'll pop down there and s see if she's in and see if we can hash this out. So I went, walked down there, and I knocked on her door, and I said, hey, you know, I'm, I represent Mr. So-and-so, and can we talk about X, Y, and Z? And she said, get out of my office and don't come back without an appointment. Um, <laughs> And that's, that's no lie. That's what she told me. And when you have city officials with that attitude, and some of them still do exist, um, you're not going to have much conducive to business here. Um, I have a client who's an HVAC contractor. He told me, I will think twice before I ever do a job in the city of Annapolis again. Because when it came time to get my permit signed off and finish the job, they said, well, he's on vacation. Well, what do I do? Well, you've got to wait. How long? Two weeks. You got to just you just got to wait. Tell the customer they got to have no uh, HVAC for two weeks. That's not acceptable. Um, you know. So primarily, what people want is a government that functions. And when you have an entrenched bureaucratic culture, what Max Weber calls the iron cage of bureaucracy descends, and it becomes a self-serving entity rather than an entity that serves the citizens. And we all know that. And we all know it requires constant vigilance and supervision to correct it and to give it the proper feedback. It doesn't just mean firing everyone, because no 10 employees you could hire are going to be any better or worse than 10 others. It means training them and supervising them correctly. Thank you, Mr. Young. <laughs> Senator Astell, what do you think the role of mayor should be in regards to cultivating an environment conducive to business development? I think the role is leadership. You know, the first thing that a leader has to do is gain the confidence of the people that work for him or her. Um, a, uh, accessibility and approachability is another uh, policy. You know, in the time that I've been in the General Assembly, both the House and the Senate, I've always had a policy that if I'm in the office and the door's open, I'm available, and you can come right in, and I'll sit down and talk to you and take your problem. The only thing an appointment does is make sure that I'm there when you're there. And I think that same thing should apply in, in the city. But, but beyond that, uh, this goes back to some of the things we've talked about earlier, the permitting process. You know, you want, to, you want business to come here, you've got to make sure that the permitting process works. Let me give you an example. I've had to replace the front porch of my house. I live down in one of those old homes. Um, <laughs> In, in downtown. And so the first thing I had to do was uh, get an architect to get a set of plans. And then I had to submit them to the city. And then they had to go through that process. And then once that got approved, then it went to the Historic Preservation Commission. And then they approved it. And then it went back um, for approval. Well, uh, I had heard that it was, had been approved. And two weeks went by. And finally, I called the mayor. It was a different mayor. 
um, and said, where is my permit? He said, well, I think it's on her desk. Well, I went down, and sure enough, it was there. It had been there for a couple weeks, and it had just never been signed. If the senator from the capital city can't get a permit out of City Hall, what <laughs> chance does the average citizen have? <laughs> the other thing, it takes cooperation. I'll tell you a little story. I was um, the other day at a bookstore down on Maryland Avenue, uh, and I like to support the small businesses in my community. So I was talking to them, and they said, you know, we have a thing we'd like to do to try to increase the business in our store. We'd like to have beer and books. You know, I have one night a week when uh, we could have uh, those um, new, uh, yeah, thank you. I'm a, I'm a, I drink vodka, I don't, uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> martinis. <clears throat> but anyway, so uh, I said, well, that's gonna require some legislation. So I brought Alderman Budge down and we talked to him and he got the, the idea of a kind of activity they like to do, and it is going to require a different kind of license. So I will tell you, in January, regardless, there will be a bill introduced in the General Assembly which will give the city council the authority to do the kind of license that will afford this business the ability to do what they want to do, which will help keep them uh, in business. So those are the kind of things that I think leadership is, is all about. It's uh, helping those people solve the problems that they're facing. So. 15 seconds, extra time. On the note, Senator, thank you very much. <clears throat> Mr. Buckley, what do you think the role of mayor should be in regards to cultivating an environment conducive to business development? Um, I think a mayor should uh, know every single business owner on, on their main street. And you have the ability to knock on those doors every day. And I, I, I run downtown uh, three mornings a week and um, uh, I'm pretty familiar with a lot of people in this town and a lot of the business problems. On West Street, you know, no, no one gave. Sorry, and this, uh, on West Street, no one gave that any chance. You know, it was an area where people thought no businesses would survive, and now West Street is a place where locals go. So we did businesses for locals. We need to broaden the base of people that are attracted to downtown, and the way we broaden that base is by thinking of other things to do that are not just the same things we've been doing again and again and again. We. we we should be striving to make this town a gastronomic destination. The market house right now is not that. <laughs> um, Harvey's a good man, you know, but I think you know, he's had a chance and everybody's had a chance and we cannot fix our downtown until we fix the market house. The market house should be the town center. It should be the place we all wanna go. I know how to get that done. So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> in the terms of, I know how to get that done. So I think that um, broadening the base of people that come to the town, making this town an arts, and a, uh, making this city an arts and a, a food destination is really important. You don't have to look far. Look at Charleston, look at Austin, look at Boulder, look at Frederick, look at those cities. You go to those cities, and you read about those mayors. Joe Riley's the one that you can talk about. He took that town, for, um, when you do interviews with a guy like that, he talks about how a town with, with uh, great public space, good food and good community art that can be shared by people of all walks of life, that's the community that you wanna build. So I spent a day with the mayor of Frederick about a month ago, and it was inspirational. That mayor would walk you around town. He would show you a restaurant where he helped him replace a tin ceiling. He would take you into their theater and show you the, the gold braiding that he'd painted on a ladder himself. He would take you down to the river walk and say, that little flower bed over there in two months, and in two weeks, there's gonna be a thousand daffodils. He cared about the details. You have to care about the details. You have to be striving to make the town as beautiful and as exceptional as possible. Possible. So I'm the sort of guy that cares about those details. West Street's been successful because we did that. And I think that downtown and all of our business communities, which I have ideas for all of those business communities and a way to connect them, should be better. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Buckley. All right, our final question before they get to their closing comments, but will be directed to start with, to Mr. Young. Uh, and it has to do with futurology, which is a word that Tim made up. I um, play words with friends. What, what is your long-term vision for Annapolis after your four-year mayoral term? What concrete changes would you like to see, and how would you make that happen with the tools currently available? 
What specific benchmarks would you use to measure your success at the end of the term? We left the crystal ball at home, so. Well, I, I, Futurology, that's not that show that's like the, that's, no, that's Futurama, yeah. right? Um, anyway, um, the, um, the number one goal, and I don't know uh, whether it can be done in one term, um, you know, um, uh, is the number one goal is to address the problem that John called and that a lot of other people have called the two Annapolises. Um, the number one goal should be so that people who live in public housing in Annapolis feel that they have resources and that they have opportunities for jobs and education in the city of Annapolis. Um, The difficulty with that, of course, is that you have to also deal with a public school system that is not run by the city of Annapolis. Um, but what you can do is you can focus on recreation and other social uh, opportunities that can play into and strengthen that. Um, it, at the end of four years, I would like to see uh, everybody in Annapolis feel that if they have a problem with the government, that there is somebody they can go to. I would like everybody in the city to know that if they have a complaint, that they can make that complaint public. Um, that's another idea that I've had is we all say, well, you know, the city's got an ombudsman. The city, you know, you can write a letter to the mayor. You can write a letter to the head of whatever department, right? Um, why don't we have a citizen panel that makes advisory recommendations when people have a grievance with the city that can just be appointed as on a volunteer basis and say, we don't think this citizen was treated fairly? Why don't we have, because I see it at council meetings all the time, people stand up and they have a grievance and the city attorney or somebody tells them to sit down and be quiet. Um, <laughs> so why don't we have a mechanism where they can air their grievances and have people look at it and say, even if it's non-binding, we don't agree with what the city did in this case. Why don't we have a petition site for the city where people, if 20 or 50 or 100 citizens think an issue needs to be addressed, where just like the whitehouse.org um, website where uh, the mayor's office will have to answer their petition uh, and say, this is, if we're not going to do what you want, at least we're going to tell you why we don't think it's a good idea. We're going to respond to it. Um, that is what people want more than anything, is a responsive government that listens. Um, they don't want to continue to feel that the city is a bureaucratic, self-serving, uh, you know, uh, cloistered entity they have to deal with and struggle to get things from. They want to feel part of this process, whether it's dealing with the police in certain communities in this city. Um, and I've talked to a lot of the residents of public housing, and people who are very happy with our police department are probably of a particular complexion, um, because that's not what I'm hearing from people in certain areas. Um, so I want everybody to feel that they have a fair shake and they've been treated fairly, primarily. Senator Astle, looking to four years ahead after your term as mayor, what are you going to do to benchmark Annapolis? Well, um, I mentioned earlier um, my vision for 2030. I think that's the first step. You know, I've been in politics now for a long time, and I know that I don't know everything. Uh, there are a lot of issues that I have to look to others, the experts that have the information that I'm going to need to make the right decision, that the city council will need to have to make the right decision. So I think the plan, the vision for 2030 would be the starting point for what I'd like to do, because that would, in that process, which would be open, transparent, the public would be intimately involved in that process, because all of us have a stake in what happens in Annapolis. You know, I, I live here downtown. I raised with my wife two boys in downtown. And I want to continue to live downtown. And I'd like to see the quality of life that um, I had when I first, well, actually, it wasn't all that great when I first came here. But it's gotten better. <laughs> it's gotten better. <clears throat> so as what the exact benchmarks would be, I want to see us, uh, our government, on a, on a sound fiscal footing so that we know that we're not going to be caught short. We don't want to end up... We don't want to end up like Detroit did, where they went bankrupt and... Uh, they put it in the hands of uh, a lawyer, and um, <laughs> sorry, and, <clears throat> and he wanted the city of Detroit to merge with the county. So how would you like 
Annapolis to go bankrupt and have to merge our fire and police department with the county. I mean, um, that's something we don't want to see. So we have to ensure that we have the re reserves, the resources. You know, our, our bond rating is only a double A. It should have been a triple A, but we've underfunded the fire and police pensions. It's gone down from 96 to 86 percent funding in the last five years. And the bond rating houses looked at that and said, mm, we're not happy with this. Uh, we don't have um, the reserves that, uh, <laughs> that I think we should have. Suppose next winter we end up with a horrendous snowstorm and uh, we got to hire those dump trucks and those front end loaders to fill the snow in the city dock. We got to have the money to handle those things and I'm not sure that we have that. So as we move forward, I want to see us on a firm financial footing. I want to see a city that really works where all the employees of the city are, are they're vested in what we do. But one of the things that I would do first as mayor is go down to the shops where the actual people work. You know, the guys at city dock that sweep the cigarette butts in the morning, they need to know that they're just as important to the function of the city of Annapolis as the guy at the top. <laughs> so, having said that, um, I've run out of time. And down to Mr. Buckley. Right. What would you do to make that happen with the tools that are currently available and how would you benchmark your time in office? So uh, I say this all the time, we should be the best side trip you can do from Washington, D.C. Or, or Baltimore. People should want to come to this town, they should want to spend money, they should want to move here. We, um, we should be a side trip where someone could think about coming from D.C., getting on a paddleboard in Spa Creek, paddling up to Pusters and having a drink. That should be a thing. We should, I want us to fight for our waterways. I want Spa Creek, Weems Creek, Back Creek to be pristine. I, I swim in those creeks with my kids. That has to be a priority. I'm running not because I need a job. I'm running for quality of life issues, and quality of life issues are, are, are the most important thing to me. I want my kids to be so proud to go downtown. I want there to be things for us to do downtown, for families to do when you get down there. There's nothing to do when families get downtown. We can't just be bars and t-shirt shops, and I can have a swing at bars and because I'm a bar owner, you know. But we need to do things at the dock. We should have things like a spray park for the kids to play with in the summer. We should have an ice ring. We should have events that are local oriented. If you make those events local oriented, we'll take back our town. Tourists are still gonna come here. Tourists wanna go where you guys go. So my priority is to make this um, the envy of the whole country. I went to see Steve Shue when I said I was gonna run. I said, Steve, look, you know, we're the same sort of guy. You're an out-of-the-box thinker, I'm an out-of-the-box thinker, you're a business owner, I'm a business owner. I want the same thing you want. I want this to be the best county in the country. I want this to be the best city in the country. My motivations are f purely for that. So that people envy us because they don't get to live here like we do. And, um, uh, and, and I make this um, a, a, an awesome place. So the environment is huge for me. Um, quality of life issues are, are huge for me. Economic vitality. You can have great ideas, but you have to have economic vitality. I, I have ideas, and I follow through with them. Outside, you can see one happening right now. Dining Under the Stars was just an idea two years ago. Right? Right. And now West Street has become the town center. You go to West Street, you go to Dining Under the Stars, you know every second person. We need to, be to build a village like that. We need to build a village where everybody feels welcome downtown and everybody feels part of the equation. So I'm, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm, gonna, do, I'm gonna build that kind of Annapolis with your help. Thank you so much. Yeah. And Mayor Panelides, you're up with the end of your four year term, your next four year term depending on how the election turns out in November <laughs> or September. Well, I'm proud of the work I've done over the first four years, and I want to talk about what I'm going to do for the future and my vision. And one of them's come up already, which is finances. And I'm proud to say that we turned the course in the city of Annapolis with city finances. You know, the pension obligations were unfunded before I took office. The city employees were paying 6.5%, and now they're paying 8%. The city government was paying 8%. Now they're paying 18%. We've almost doubled our, contributors, our contributions to the pension fund. 
You know, a lot of people talk about city finances. You know, everybody up on the stage has a political opinion on what we think city finances should be. But there's bond rating agencies that do this full time for a living. They're professionals. And we've actually had two rounds of upgrades. You know, that's one of the challenges. People say, you're down, our down, credit rating's down, it's not. And I'll just read you what they said. They said, quote from Fitch, the city's strong financial profile reflects positive revenue growth, prospects from an improving tax base, manageable expenditure growth, and a demonstrated ability to reduce expenditures during economic downturns. And Moody's upgraded us as well. You know, I want to talk about another issue I got a big passion for, and that's the environment. You know, growing up as an Eagle Scout, you learn something early on. You got to leave it better than you found it. And that's what we've been doing in the city of Annapolis. One of the things we have to do is create green energy, green jobs. So what are we doing? The city of Annapolis gave or is uh, leasing the closed landfill to a developer who's going to put up 50,000 solar panels. It's going to create the city $5 million in revenue and create green jobs for everybody. You know, when we talk about the vision of the two Annapolises, a lot of people talk about really haven't heard solutions on how they're going to do it. They just say things are bad. But I'd like to tell you about what I've done. And I'll start off by telling you a story. You know, right next door, I mentioned my grandparents' restaurant, the Royal Restaurant. It was the first, city, it was the first restaurant in the city of Annapolis to serve African Americans. And I learned early on from that, the way my parents brought me up, we got to treat everybody the same. And I see we weren't doing that. The city now has an African American liaison. We have an Hispanic liaison, and we've tried to make diversity a priority in my administration. I'll just give you a fact about quoting things that are wrong. You know, something was in the paper the other day. It said the mayor has no females in his administration, and he hasn't appointed any women to the Housing Authority Board. They printed it like it was a fact. And I talked to the editor. I said, that's not true. I said, I can go down the list with you. I have a female chief of staff. We have an events coordinator. We have a woman running our IT department, human resources department, economic development, and for the first time in city's history, we have a female harbor master and almost also a female city attorney. So as this debate, so as this debate goes on, people are going to say, and I've appointed two women to the Housing Authority Board, people are going to say, the mayor hates women. You know, the, the city's finances are terrible. Don't, don't believe that. Here are the facts. You can go to my website. I'm going to have YouTube videos. I'm proud of the diversity I brought. I think it's our strength. The last thing I'll say on closing real quick is... Um, what we need to do in the future for the business community. Is that my time? You're kind of out. All right. You're out. You're I'll out. save it for the close. Hi, <laughs> right, Mr. Barron and uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. So we are done with the uh, question portion. Thank you, guys. Right. So we are now onto the talent portion of the contest. That's <laughs> Actually, what we're going to do is, we're, as we're going to wrap up, each candidate will get three minutes uh, for closing remarks. As we did at the beginning, we're going to start with Senator Astell. Senator. Thank you. And uh, thanks again for everyone that's, that's out here. Um, <clears throat> you know, this is, uh, this is serious business running the city. Um, there are a lot of responsibilities, and there are jobs that, uh, that really have to get done, and they have to get done in the right way. But you know, Carl Snowden, in an op-ed piece that he did a couple days ago in the paper, I think he pegged it pretty carefully. He said, when you go to the vote in this election, you need to be sure about who you're voting for. And so you need to look at their record. I have a record. I have a record as a member of the House of Delegates. I have a record as a member of the Senate. And you can look at the votes I've cast, and you can see where my mind has been and where my mind is looking as I do work towards the future. So those votes are there. They're in stone. Um, the other thing, um, you know, we talk about the arts, and I've been accused sometimes of not being really a supporter of the arts, but let me tell you a little story about a mural. Um, that's a hot topic here, I know. Um, <laughs> um, we were approached, uh, Mike Bush and I, uh, by some folks down on Clay Street that uh, the children there wanted to do a mural, and they wanted to put it on the Arundel Center. Well, the county executive then, the one that, remember that John guy, um, he said, no, absolutely, it's not going to go on the building. So what we did was go across the street to the state building. We got permission from the Department of General Services for the children to paint that mural on the side of that building. So John Leopold had to look at it out of his office every day. <laughs> and, then, and then just to make sure, we put lights on it so he had to see it at night as well. 
So <clears throat> I think that uh, that my record uh, stands for itself, the votes that I've cast, the things that I've done. I care about my community, and I look forward to continuing to serve. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Astle. Mr. Buckley. I want to thank you all, and I want to thank uh, John and Tim for doing this and keeping it funny. Thank you so much. You've got to have a sense of humor about this stuff. So I'm not running against Mike or, or John or Nevin. I'm not running because I need a job. I'm not running um, because I have higher political aspirations. I'm running as a change candidate. Now, if you don't want any change, I'm probably not the best guy. But we need some change ideas in this town. We need... We need some new ideas downtown. Ask yourself this question. You can say it's as good as you, uh, uh, all the time. You can say that it's different, this is f better, that, that's better, but stand on Main Street and does it feel any different? Try to get a permit, does it feel any different? So maybe that's gonna happen in my second term, but it doesn't feel any different now. So that, that's the thing I'm running for. I'm running for change. I think that um, uh, we, well, there's so much more that we can do if we just connect the dots. There's so much unrealized potential in this town. And I, um, I can say, I can go on my record of West Street and say, we made some change happen there. But we can't be a great community until we make a great community for everybody. And so I, I, we need to start looking at some new ideas. We need to start thinking about some of our modern history. When you save all the buildings, you can't just save a building and then say, oh, my work is done here and fold your arms and then think that, we've, uh, that your job is done. You have to make those buildings viable. You have to create economic vitality in these buildings. So we need to look at that. We need to start looking at um, new ideas um, um, on, in terms of, uh, I'm a bit nervous now, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> We need to look at new ideas that get people downtown. So, um, uh, uh, sorry, I've just blown it then. <laughs> this is the biggest audience I've ever talked to in my life. <laughs> so, uh, I had a big finish, but I lost it. Uh, I wanna <laughs> and I want to thank you all. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Buckley. Mayor Panelides. So I want to talk with everybody about what we're going to do in the future for the city of Annapolis. And one of the things I didn't get to finish in my last statement was about the environment. You know, I put a million dollars for the first time in the city's history into the capital fund for stormwater management because we have to get serious about these challenges. They're not going to fix themselves and we have to do it. And I'm proud to say that passed. I also want to talk about bipartisanship. You know, as I said earlier, there's no Democrat, Republican way to put out a fire. And I've passed my budgets. I've passed adequate public facilities. I've done it working across the aisle. And I'd like to highlight our fire department for a second. You know, in Maryland, out of these 157 cities, there's only two that have a class one fire department. And Annapolis just became one of those two. No. Now, what does that mean for everybody? That means that every single residential property and commercial business is eligible for a reduction in their insurance rates. I want to talk real quick about something that seems to come up every year. You know, we talked about parking and everything else. That's the police and fire department merger. So let me just say this. I said it four years ago. I'll say it today. I'm sure I'll have to say it four more times. I have no intention of merging the police and fire department at all in this city. The other thing came up about selling the rec center. There's no plans to sell the rec center at all whatsoever. Um, in terms of Main Street, I'm doing some of the rebuttals now. There's about a 5% vacancy rate on Main Street. So I think that's pretty good to have 95% of it full going forward. You know, what we can talk about is we can talk about the future real quick. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close on this note. You know, when I ran for four mayor, mayor four years ago, people took a chance on me. They took a chance to see if I could get things done. And I've been able to do things that nobody thought we could. You know, if you went to Las Vegas and took a bet and asked yourself the following question, would the mayor be able to lower trash bills by 40%? Would he be able to pass four budgets without raising the tax rate? Would he be able to build an energy park that has 50,000 solar panels creating green jobs? Would he be able to reduce the rates of insurance and have our fire department be a class one rating? Would he be able to reach across the aisle with County Executive uh, Steve Shu to bring massive transportation initiatives to the city? 
I think the answer would be no. I don't think anybody would have bet that I could do it, but I did. And I did that because there's a lot of great people in this city. And I promise you this, you know, we talk about the future of careers in politics. I'm term limited. I only have one more term. And that's why I work so hard every day. And if you give me another opportunity, I'm going to build on everything we've done already. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And finally, Mr. Young. Okay. Um, here's, here's, here's the pitch, right? Um, uh, we now, in, in this city, spend $10 million a year more than we did four years ago. Um, we've been able to afford it because uh, property assessments are up. You know, we don't know which way the economy is going. Um, we have more police officers, but we don't see them more than 45 minutes out of their cars. We have more firefighters, and that might be a good thing, but we also have federal grant money paying for these things, and someday somebody's gonna have to pension these guys or figure out how to pay them if the federal grant money goes away. So there are a lot of things we can do short term that look like good ideas, uh, but aren't necessarily fiscally responsible. Um, there's also a lot of uh, <coughs> things that have gone on in the last few years that haven't been addressed. And what I can promise you is this. I can promise you that my first loyalty will not be to department heads or to city employees or to police chiefs or fire chiefs or planning and zoning directors. Um, my first loyalty will be to the citizens of Annapolis. And my first loyalty will be <coughs> just as important as the business owner is when he wants to get a permit so also just as important is the opportunity for an education or a job for somebody in Ward 6 or Ward 5 or somebody who's struggling. Um, we can no longer afford to neglect people uh, on the other side of town. Uh, it's, it's, it, you know, this is an ultimately a deteriorating state that we're in and a lot of us are happy over wherever we are and we don't see it, um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't it isn't happening. We had how many homicides? We have to ask ourselves uh, just a few months ago. Um, you know, and I think Carl Snowden pointed out it was more homicides per capita in that period of time than the city of Chicago. Um, we need to think about that. Um, <coughs> so anyway, uh, if you want a mayor who is not going to go along to get along and who is not going to let department heads run things however they like to run things uh, without reining them in when they trod on the citizens' rights, then that's me. Uh, because I don't care what city employees think of me or what uh, appointees think of me. I care what the citizens of Annapolis think of me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. And let's keep it going for all of our candidates tonight. They did a great job. Senator John Astle, Gavin Buckley. Mayor Michael Vanalides and Mr. Yevon Young. Thank you, gentlemen, for participating tonight. It's been fantastic. And, and as, as we close out the night, first of all, again, I want to thank all the candidates for coming out here. And I want to really thank you all for running, actually. It, take, it takes a lot to run for office. And you all need to be lauded for what you've done, the dedication that you all have. We need to thank the Rams head once again, Bill, Kyle, Laura, Chris, and Royal. And Adam back there running the sound. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Uh, big thank you to the volunteers that helped keep the time, record the video. The Arundel Patriot took care of some of our glitches and got some live streaming up John's there. John's glitches. Um, you know, and, and a huge thank you to the servers that have been busting their humps all night for you. Please tip them well. Um, and a giant thank you to you. You guys are the best looking, the smartest, the most engaged audience that we've had. And the biggest, as Mr. Buckley has just said. And thanks to John um, and Tim. But, uh, and the information you've heard here tonight hopefully will help guide you in the, determining who to support in the election and enable you to make an informed vote. We encourage you to take advantage of all the opportunities to see them. Uh, they could be forums, debates, meet and greets, fundraisers, do it. Listen to the Maryland Crabs podcast, read Eye on Annapolis, follow us on all the social things and look for the debate after the primary. And at the end of the night, around the corner, if you exit out and keep going to your left is the fountain room and we've got tables set up for the candidates so you can pick up some swag and whatnot there. And there's the drop box so you can drop your vote in the thing. Thank you all again. Thank we appreciate much. it and have a good night. And that was the debate. 
I thought it was really good for our first shot out, if I do say so ourselves. It did. We certainly learned some lessons. Yeah. Um, we're going to figure out we operationally a, how to make it work a little bit better. We did our more to it. we got to buy that little cable that, that um, we need. But as for that straw poll, uh, like I said, we had about 70% return out of the 300 and some odd people there. And out of the four candidates, Gavin Buckley came away with 38% of the vote. Followed by Mayor Pantelides with 32%, John Ast- Senator John Astle with 20%, and Nevin Young with 6%. So, and we had to point out, though, that, I mean, it's super unscientific because I think you can pack a room, you can have a certain amount of people, supporters come in. So it's, I don't know how accurate the straw, straw poll was, oh, sure, but, it was sure. but it was really, it was really interesting. It was, uh, and, you know, you can judge for yourself uh, as to how strong the candidates were. I mean, the questions we were asking were very broad based. There was nothing that was super probing. And there shouldn't have been anything that was a surprise to any of them. Nothing was no. It's it. Those those should have all been expected, and they probably should have expected something on traffic. They probably should have expected something on the finances. So they all were that seen- tree question thrown. Yes, <laughs> Senator Astle, you can't see it. He did freeze for a second, like <laughs> that was just what kind of tree. And he just kind of froze and stared at me. I'm like, I'm just kidding, sir. <laughs> But uh, so when we get into the debates and we're going to start planning on that uh, after we do our postmortem for this. I think the questions we'll probably have probably closer to you know, probably 12 to 15 questions for that. Uh, it'll probably be a little bit longer and it will be probably a little more aggressive. Well, so, we've got fewer candidates, obviously. Exactly. So we can spend you know, a lot more time getting in depth. And there's a lot of stuff that we can do that's not as broad based. And as we run into the... Um election season and the primary coming up, we've got to get off our ass and work on the aldermen, yep. the aldermanic candidates. And we're going to be doing crab cakes for all of them. So right. that's and going to be our next little project. So make sure you stay tuned for them. Yeah. And the reason that we're only doing the crab cakes, remember the crab cakes are shorter. The reason is because there's just so many that we, there's no way it just mathematically, we couldn't do anything that's, uh, that's any longer just because there's so many. There's a lot of aldermanic uh, candidates that popped up, which is going to be a lot of fun. There's a lot of uh, a lot of wards that 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 John has predicted is going to be turned over, and I had a few people last night who were disagreeing with you, which was interesting, but because they said they had talked to you about it. But there's a lot of interesting candidates, more more so than I think I've ever seen since I've lived here. Yeah, so absolutely. It, this so. is going to be a really fun election. So anyway, so stay tuned to all that, and thanks for listening, and for everyone who came last night, thanks for coming, and thanks again to Ramshead, and thanks again to Adam McIntosh. You guys are all fantastic. In the meantime, you can find us on Facebook. We have a page, and we have a group at uh, the. Maryland Crabs. You can find us on Twitter at MD Crabs Podcast. John's at I in Annapolis. I'm at Tim Hamilton 47. Send us an email at info at the Crabs.com, our webpage at the Crabs.com. Subscribe and rate and comment on Apple Podcasts, on Google Play. You can find us on Alexa. Just say, hey, Alexa, play the Maryland Crabs podcast. So that's about it. That's where you're going to find us. Right. Whatever you listen to your podcast to, all of them have the sharing capability. You can share it, too. If you're just listening to this episode, just hit the share button and if, let your neighbors, let your friends know about uh, what's going on in the city because it's important. we got four years. we got to work with this, one of these guys. This is a critically important election for, for the city. There's a lot of stuff going on, so you really pay attention to what's going on. This has been the Maryland Crabs podcast with Tim Hamilton and John Fernay. Sure to follow them in all the regular places, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and online at themarylandcrabs.com. Take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Now, get the hell out of my kitchen. Seriously, go! You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.